Okay, hi everybody. It's a real pleasure to have um, Professor Justin Dressler, who hails from sunny California, um, um, the Los Angeles area, from um, Chapman University. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Justin when I went out to Chapman and I gave a, a, collo a colloquium and some talks. And Justin and I just could not, we just continued talking physics way into the night. Um, he's also a really interesting person. Um, I know he spent some time, a lot of time in Japan as well. Um, and did some, some of his very, um, in Brazil. Um, and also he did his PhD. Justin, uh, you did your PhD. Um, are you at Irvine for a while, right? Is that where you did your PhD? I did my PhD at University of Rochester. And then That's did right. Postdoc in um, Riverside. Recently. In Riverside. And then Tokyo, right? Or Japan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And yeah, just a little um, thing about what, you know, where he lives. I mean, he's very interdisciplinary, but he, he researches the foundation of quantum physics, um, mathematics, and computer science. And his research mainly focuses on algebraic approaches to generalized quantum measurements quantum computation and superconducting transmon quantum qubits. And he, he and I connect because he also spends a lot of his free time whenever he has it to think about how all that talks to quantum gravity. So on that note, it's a pleasure to have you, Justin. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be invited to this talk and uh, hopefully you learn something from it or at least find it somewhat interesting. I expect it's probably different than most of the talks that come through this venue, if I had to guess. Uh, and it's also kind of unusual because um, as you see at the bottom of my slide here at Chapman, we have an Institute for Quantum Studies. And in fact, most of my thinking is quantum related, uh, but this topic doesn't really seem very quantum -y. It's talking about field theory and acoustics and it's about as classical as you can get. Um, but I think you'll see as I develop this, uh, where some of these ideas cross over into quantum and cross over into other areas uh, like quantum gravity concerns, but in a simpler, more concrete way where we can think about it more easily. Uh, so without further ado, um, what is the motivation here? Motivation is that there is a thing called acoustic spin. And this surprised a lot of people <laughs> because Acoustics is a field that's been around for a long time. And the way most people think about acoustics is in terms of linear acoustic waves, which are longitudinal, and they usually are described with a scalar potential field. Um, and in fact, when you write down the Lagrangian formalism for linear acoustic waves, then you see that this scalar potential is the dynamical field in the Lagrangian. Uh, but there's a problem that scalar fields do not support intrinsic spin. They have spin zero. Uh, and so if we observe acoustic spin, this is at odds with the way that it is usually described in the Lagrangian formalism, which piqued my interest. Uh, and it piqued my interest for several reasons, which you'll see. But the point is that in 2019, and this is just how recent this is, <laughs> people have kind of realized this is actually a thing that sound fields can do. Um, they measured acoustic spin. And they measured it in a very simple way here. I just reproduced some of the, the plots you see on the right here. And basically they just directed two speakers in orthogonal directions such that the sound coming out of them overlapped. And of course, if you have two longitudinal fields going in orthogonal directions that are oscillating molecules back and forth and you put those waves out of phase, then the molecules are going to rotate in a little ellipse or a circle. And so the molecules actually have orbital angular momentum at the microscopic level. And you can see how when you smooth that all out into a field theory, you're going to get an intrinsic spin at every point of that acoustic field. And so it's, it's somewhat glaringly obvious it should be there. And actually it's a little bit surprising that people didn't notice it before this point. But they measured it. Uh, and this prompts, of course, this theoretical question, this very theoretical question, because we understand the experiment, we understand the microscopics pretty well, but how do we understand the field theory? And this is where it gets very interesting. Um, so just like I, I said, microscopically, this is a fairly easy to understand phenomenon. Um, and if we look at the pressure and the velocity fields of the sound wave, then those do have enough structure to describe the spin. 
And that's because the velocity field is a vector degree of freedom. And so it has enough directionality to actually handle uh, the orbiting motion that the spin entails. But the scalar field, the scalar potential field does not have enough structure to it to accomplish this. Um, so that raises the key question of what is the correct dynamical potential field uh, that we should use to describe acoustics? And we'll see uh, very shortly that this has very strong analogies to electromagnetism, which is actually an origin of why I got so interested in this topic. Uh, and to really just kind of make that analogy quantitative, um, here's a comparison between acoustic theory, the linear acoustic theory, and the electromagnetic theory at the level of the equations of motion. Do you see on, on the left here, we have um, pressure variable and a velocity variable, uh, which describe this, the sound wave. Uh, and then there are characteristics of the medium. There's a mass density and a compressibility such that the speed of sound is one over the root of the product of those things. And if we compare this to the electromagnetic case and just look at four Maxwell's equations here, uh, you see that there's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping on how these things relate to each other. Um, but there's a few key differences. Uh, the acoustic case is longitudinal as opposed to the electromagnetic case is just transversal. Uh, and there's a clear mismatch in dimension. The pressure is a scalar variable here, whereas the, it corresponds to the velocity, which is a, a um, sorry, the pressure corresponds to the magnetic field which is a vector variable. And so there's a mismatch in dimension. But when you look at the, the characteristics, epsilon naught and mu naught, they behave very similarly to this rho and beta, such that the speed of light uh, in vacuum has the same structure as the speed of sound in this acoustic medium. So this is already very suggestive that there's, there's a lot to draw on here as an analogy. Um, and we can go a little bit further. If we look at the Lagrangian density, then we can write it on the right. You're probably most familiar as just this usual electromagnetic Lagrangian as a difference between the electric and the uh, magnetic field strengths. Um, and the corresponding Lagrangian on the left for acoustics actually has a very nice form. It looks like one half mv squared minus a potential term. <laughs> and so it actually has kind of the structure you would expect a Lagrangian to have just as a density. Now, um, when we talk about the Lagrangian, of course, we can't just use the form that I've written here, because if we try to say vary the Lagrangian with respect to the electric field directly or the magnetic field directly, we will not get the correct equations of motion. And the same thing's true in acoustics. If we try to vary the Lagrangian with respect to velocity or respect to pressure, we will not get the correct equations of motion. Uh, in order to get the correct equations of motion, we have to make a, a potential representation of these fields. Um, and this is where the problems begin. So on the right, we see here that um, in electromagnetism, we usually use this electric potential, um, which has both a scalar and a vector part. Um, and once we make that assignment of how the potential relates to the fields, we can rewrite the Lagrangian in terms of the potential, and then we can vary the Lagrangian with respect to the potential and get the correct equations of motion. And this all works perfectly well. Uh, but on the left, now we have the scalar potential. And this is the way it's usually done in acoustics. We have this scalar field and uh, take the gradient to get the velocity, take the time derivative and get the pressure. Um, but it does not have vector degrees of freedom. And so when I vary the Lagrangian with respect to the scalar field, I do get the correct kind of wave equation of motion of the scalar field, but I do not get any of the vector character of the field. That's sort of lost in this representation, even though it looks like a faithful representation at face, face value. And this is the source of the discrepancy that we, we cannot get spin out of this representation. Um, so this raises the question, how, how do we fix this? What, what else can we do here, uh, theoretically? Um, so let's go back and look at this analogy much more closely. This acoustic theory clearly has the same basic structures as electromagnetism, but it does have a few key differences. Uh, the dimensions are different. Uh, pressure and velocity is a one plus three dimensional pair. Uh, they are involved in the stress energy tensor. They are not the dynamical field. And that's analogous to E and H, which is a three plus three dimensional pair. Um, 
And so we have to understand that difference in dimension a little bit. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, the acoustic cases are longitudinal, whereas the electromagnetic cases are transverse. And that's, that's a big difference in how they behave. Um, but C in both cases is the, some invariant speed, uh, in this case of sound in the medium, uh, instead of light and vacuum, but it behaves very, very similarly. And we can actually use that uh, to our advantage um, because if we look more closely at these, these pairings that I've outlined here, this P in velocity, this pressure and velocity actually does transform as a four vector. If we think of that as kind of the scalar and vector part of a Lorentz four vector in one plus three dimensions. And similarly, E and H uh, transform as a space-time five vector just normally. This is the rank two anti-symmetric tensor, um, which you could think of as a bivector as I'll, I'll mention shortly. So what this tells us is that there may be a strong reason to think in four dimensions here and to really construct something that seems maybe artificial at first, um, but turns out to be exceedingly useful. And that's to construct a space-time framework where we're just replacing the speed of light with the speed of sound in the medium. And you can think of this as a framework that describes the set of signals that can be processed in a, uh, a sound medium where there's an invariant speed of sound. And we're just setting up the mathematics such that the speed of sound is invariant from the get-go. Uh, in case may I have a question. So in this case, you, you want to have the constant speed of sound. That means you consider the incompressible density, right? You, you, want, you want to have the density doesn't change. Yes, yes. And that's, this is not an innocent assumption here. And you're right. So we have to make it so that the speed of sound is invariant, which means incompressible. It also means we have to be in some sort of fluid-like medium so it doesn't have directionality. Because in the crystal lattices, for example, you can have different speeds in different directions. We don't want to add any of those complications. We want to consider kind of the simplest case here, incompressible uh, fluid-like medium with a constant speed of sound. Okay, thank you. That's an astute point though. But under this assumption where we have this invariant speed of sound, which is pretty much always assumed when we have these linear acoustic waves anyway, so this is kind of a, a consistent assumption here. Uh, then what we're introducing is essentially a Lorentz metric on a tangent algebra for the space where we have this, this fluid. And just like the usual space-time metric, I'm gonna pick a, a plus, minus, minus, minus signature, and then we'll create a tangent algebra using that metric, uh, which will be the Clifford algebra of this metric over the reals. And I'll, I'll mention that in a second, what, what that's talking about. Um, but what we'll discover is that by introducing this mathematical framework, then the structure of how we can think about the potentials in the theory become much more obvious. And all these similarities between acoustics and electromagnetism become manifest. Now, I don't know how much background everyone has in space-time and algebras and whatnot. So I wanted to take a brief diversion to kind of introduce this stuff just in case it's new. Uh, and if it's not new, then you can pat yourself on the back and say, yeah, I know all that. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, we're going to construct an algebra, an associative algebra, using the Minkowski metric. And this will allow us to do derivations much, much more easily and see geometric and invariant geometric structure on this kind of space much more easily. So what we do is we start with Minkowski space. So we just pick a basis of vectors. And for reasons that will become clear, I'll just name them gamma, such that gamma zero is the time-like vector and gamma one, two, three are the space-like vectors. Um, that means there's a dot product such that gamma naught with itself is one, gamma k, all the other ones with themselves are minus one. And that dot product is defined by the Minkowski metric, the symmetric bilinear form. And we usually talk about tensor components, which are just uh, the numbers you get from putting in these basis elements. So unlike um, component-based tensor analysis, we're actually going to be caring about the, the basis the, itself, not just the components in some basis. Now, once we have this basis and we have this Minkowski space, then in order to create an algebra, we need to define a product between these vectors. Um, so we're going to define it constructively uh, because I think it's, it's nice to see that you can do this. 
Um, so we'll just define a product such that it's associative, it's left distributive, it's right distributive. And the most important point is that if we square a vector in this algebra, that's equivalent to applying the Minkowski metric. So squaring a vector just gives you its Minkowski norm. And it turns out these four axioms are sufficient to constructively define this Clifford algebra in its entirety. Um, and I gave a little example here of how just applying the square on a sum here, you distribute over the sum and you reach the conclusion pretty quickly that the metric itself um, is encoded as the symmetric part of this associative product. So if I just take, take this metric part, that is the dot product, which is the metric. And so this construction has embedded the metric um, as, as the symmetric part. And you can think of this as kind of a quotient operation in disguise. If I take the whole tensor algebra and make this box my quotient over the algebra, then I'll get this Clifford algebra. And that's another way to define it. But here we're doing it just from axioms. Now, if I continue investigating sort of what is this product, you find that in addition to the symmetric part, there's an anti-symmetric part. And that becomes exactly the same uh, wedge product, the Grassmann wedge product that is introduced in differential forms to create a Grassmann algebra out of the space. And this allows us to really create different grades of higher dimensional objects in the space. So with that structure out of the way, then we can just constructively build the basis of the whole space because now we have this uh, Grassmann wedge product. Um, so we see that's that. another dumb question. Um, yep. A way of saying this too for like, you know, if I think about myself as a particle person, um, as the way spinners will transform in Minkowski space. Yeah, and so in fact, spinners will come up here. Um, spinners will appear as the even graded subspace of, of what I have here actually in front of us. Um, but yeah, spinner, spinner transformations will, will be um, kind of one-sided transformations. And it turns out that spinners have a role of kind of a one-sided group action. Um, and then if you have a bilinear and a spinner, that's a two-sided group action, like a, an automorphism on the algebra. Um, okay. But it, it, it's very neat how it all, all comes together. And the Clifford algebra really kind of makes it apparent what's happening, I think. All right, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so a few, a few notes here. So if I have two basis elements, uh, gamma mu, gamma nu, and I take their product, uh, because they're orthonormal in the Minkowski sense, it means that if mu is equal to nu, I'm just going to get the dot product. Uh, and if mu is not equal to nu, then the dot product part is zero. And so if I go back quickly, you see that the product is just the dot product plus the wedge product. And so if the dot product is zero, then the product is simply the wedge product. Uh, so that means you, you can equivalently write this wedge product as just the product in this Clifford algebra when they're orthonormal like, or when they're orth orthogonal like this, which means that they're um, anti-symmetric under this associative product. And this gives us uh, a lot of very nice properties because now we have an associative product uh, that's anti-symmetric. And the, uh, the basis we started out with, we can think of as the contravariant basis where we usually define four vectors. And we can define a dual basis in the usual way where we just take the inverse vector. And of course, now that we have an associative algebra, we can just take the inverse uh, by just multiplying by itself uh, and then dividing by that norm. And that'll give us the inverted vector. Um, and you can think of this as a co-vector basis um, it's often called the reciprocal basis when you're dealing with Euclidean spaces. Um, you can think of this as effectively the same as a one form basis that goes under many names, but we can just define it here very easily. Now, once we have this, this product, then we can construct the 16 dimensional space, which is now graded. So it has five different grades, which correspond to different dimensionalities of sub geometries. So the scalars, which are the real numbers, are going to be our points in our tangent space. The vectors that we started out with here, these are going to be our lines, our tangent vectors in our, in our tangent space. But now I can create higher dimensional objects. So if I take successive wedge products, I'm going to get a set of planes. And there's going to be three hyperbolic planes, which correspond to boost rotations, three elliptical planes, which correspond to spatial rotations. If I keep doing products, I'll find four uh, pseudo vector 
um, volumes. These are three volumes. And there's one space-like, three time-like. And if I take a product of all orthogonal things, I'll, of course, get a four volume, uh, which we'll see is the pseudo-scalar of the space. It's the unit four volume of the space. Uh, but all of these grades are independent of each other. So they're all linearly independent, which means I can add them all together. And so what I've actually created here is this 16 dimensional space where I have independent grades, uh, zero through four, which I can project onto. And a vector that spans this entire 16 dimensional space, or we're gonna call a multi-vector. And all geometric objects that are invariant under this Minkowski kind of framework are going to exist as multi-vectors. This means this gives us kind of the right playground in some sense to see what the invariant geometric structure is going to look like. Uh, now, a very useful tactic, because we're often going to be working in a particular reference frame, is to define what's called a relative three-dimensional frame. Um, and this, a lot, this is one of the great, I think, benefits of working in a Clifford algebra, is that I can map between kind of this covariant four-dimensional space where everything's manifestly covariant. Uh, into what it would look like in a particular reference frame, uh, all within the same algebra. And the transform is very, very simple. Uh, so the, the relative three vectors, so these would be kind of the I hat, J hat, K hat that we learn in physics 101. These in this algebra are actually planes, interestingly enough. Uh, and they're defined by taking a spatial axis and dragging it along a particular time-like uh, world line. And so the plane that you get from dragging space along the world line is the apparent space, the observed spatial direction in that particular frame. And you can write it out in these, these ways. And then uh, just to keep things clear, I'm gonna give it a special notation as just a relative spatial direction now. Uh, and I'm gonna give it the notation sigma because it's going to be related to the Pauli algebra. And anything that is a relative three vector, I'll just put a usual vector symbol over it. That way we can keep track of what are relative quantities versus what are proper quantities that are relativistically invariant. Uh, so when I make this notational change, interestingly enough, um, the pseudoscalar of the space, which I'll just give a special notation of I, it's just the product of all of our four space-time vectors, um, I can rewrite that identically as a product of the relative vectors in a particular reference frame. And so it turns out this pseudoscalar is kind of an invariant volume uh, in any reference frame. It behaves exactly the same way because it is exactly the same four volume. And this four volume has an interesting algebraic property. It squares to minus one. And as long as I work within an even grade, so zero, two, and four, then it commutes with everything. And so inside an even graded subspace, this unit four volume really does act like a scalar imaginary, but it has a very deep geometric meaning, uh, which turns out to be exceedingly useful as we'll see. But we have to be a little bit careful with this thing, which is why I notate it as capital I rather than lowercase i, because even though it commutes with the odd grade or the even grade, it anti-commutes with the odd grade. So it's not entirely equivalent to a scalar imaginary in this algebra. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, but once I introduce these two notations, then I can go back to my 16 dimensional bases. You see, this is kind of complicated to start with, but I can drastically simplify it once I choose a reference frame by just rewriting things in terms of these relative vectors and this factor of i. And it turns out that um, the four vectors, uh, if I just multiply them by i, then that's going to give me a transformation, uh, which takes, um, it, it's, it's actually the Hodge star transformation that contracts out from the four volume, that one vector and gives me the orthogonal three volume that, uh, to, to that vector. And that's what's gonna be a pseudo scalar, sorry, a pseudo vector in the algebra. And you can see why it, it actually acts like a pseudo vector now, because when I write it this way, you see it's a vector, but it also has this factor of i in it, which is the unit four volume, which means if I do a parity flip, then I'm going to get an added parity flip from this factor of i over what I would have gotten with my, my vector. So it actually makes that, that parity behavior manifest in some sense. Uh, and the same thing we see with the scalars, they become dual to the the four volumes, 
through this multiplication by i, which is exactly what we expect with the Hodge star. But the planes in 4D are interesting because uh, we have six planes and they're sort of self-dual. There's two sectors of planes with different signatures and they are Hodge duals of each other. So I can sort of flip between uh, kind of time-like boost planes and space-like rotation planes, and they're only different by a factor of i. Now, what's interesting here is that this um, even graded subalgebra here is actually a closed subalgebra. And that is in fact the Clifford algebra of 3D space. So by doing this kind of notational juggling, I have now embedded a three-dimensional representation inside my four-dimensional algebra such that I can work in 4D. And then when I want to go to a particular reference frame, I just drop into it by factoring out this uh, gamma knot, for example, for that particular frame. And then everything collapses down to this nice um, even graded subspace. And the factor of i commutes with that entire even graded subspace. And so as long as I work within that subspace, it is absolutely equivalent to the Pauli matrix algebra with complex numbers, uh, except every element of that algebra now has a geometric meaning, not only in three-dimensional space, but also in the four-dimensional space it's embedded in. So I can sort of see these nested structures uh, directly. Uh, so when I do this, the multi-vector, multi I can just expand out its parts in a particular way. Um, and then I can see the elements that I expect to see in a particular three-dimensional reference frame. So in particular, I'll see a scalar alpha. Uh, each four vector will have kind of a scalar part and a three vector part to it, uh, which is a para-vector representation of the four vector. And the bivector splits into two halves, each of which is a separate three vector with the second half having this extra factor of i that converts it into a rotational plane rather than a boost plane. So without belaboring this too much longer, since I'm babbling a little bit here, um, this means that our multivectors have several useful forms. I can see what the proper form of them is. Um, there are different grades. So I have scalars, four vectors, bivectors, pseudo vectors, pseudo scalars, which I can just write out in now a nice, easy way. I can actually combine these factors of i now in an interesting way and see that I actually have complex scalars built into my algebra and complex vectors built into my algebra with the caveat that this i anti commutes with the vector here. Um, and then I have bivectors, which are the usual rank two anti-symmetric tensors. And I can take that same multivector and expand it out in a particular reference frame. And that's just doing what I, I said earlier. So the scalar expands to just alpha. A polar, polar uh, four vector turns into a polar para vector like so. Uh, the bi vector will split into a polar part and an axial vector part. And then the pseudo vector uh, will have this axial para vector that goes with it and so forth. So I can see all the things that I expect to see in 4D. And if I really like tensor components, of course, they're all there. I just expand out any of these objects in the basis that I chose, and then I have all of my components there. Um, but one reason this, this formalism is particularly nice is it makes it very easy to go between this kind of rank two anti-symmetric tensor way of looking at things to this pair of three vectors way of looking at things in a particular reference frame. And usually that step of uh, jumping between these two formalisms is a little bit awkward, but in the uh, Clifford algebra formalism, that becomes really easy to do, which is very helpful for something like electromagnetism. Okay, now the last thing that we need to introduce in order to, to fully describe our acoustic system is uh, the notion of fields over the whole manifold of points and also derivatives of those fields. Uh, and this is very easy to do. We just say that uh, at each point x, then we have a tangent vectors at that point, which gives us our um, gamma basis. Uh, and then we introduce our Minkowski metric, and then we build up the whole tangent algebra exactly as we just did at every point x. And then we can treat each point x as kind of a displacement vector away from some origin on the manifold. And it turns out you can always do this in a sensible way. Um, so that's easy enough. We just sort of make everything I just discussed a function of x. The next thing is to define the notion of a derivative, 
And it again turns out this is really easy because Dirac already did this when he made his Dirac equation. And so if I take each of these gammas and, then, and if I look at the, the dual gamma, because this is actually a covector, um, then I just multiply by the partial derivative of that coordinate and uh, the summation of the partial derivatives with those basis vectors is the vector derivative, the four vector derivative on that, on that manifold. Now, usually in say Dirac theory, they represent these gammas by matrices such that this Dirac operator uh, is actually a matrix operator, uh, but we actually don't need to do this at all. Um, the abstract algebraic setting works just fine. We don't need to have a matrix representation of anything here. Uh, these are just unit vectors in 4D space as far as we care. So this is constructed exactly like we would construct a three gradient and again, like physics 102 or something like that. Uh, but once we have this object, then we can actually do several splits of it into three-dimensional space, which are very convenient. If I just factor out a gamma naught on the left of it, then I'll see a paravector version of this derivative, which is a sum of a time derivative and a three gradient. If I factor the gamma naught out on the other side, then it anti-commutes with uh, the, the vector part, and so I just get a flip and sign. Uh, so it allows me to jump between kind of the 4D derivative to our 3D derivatives very, very easily. Uh, now, if I look at how this 4D derivative acts on a four vector, this is actually quite interesting because this is a now Clifford product of that 4D vector with another 4D vector, which means it actually splits into a sum of kind of a dot product and a wedge product with the derivative. And if you're used to differential forms, this is actually precisely the same thing as um, if I brought together the co-differential or, or the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the co-differential, which is um, the divergence in, in differential forms and the exterior derivative, uh, which is the curl in differential forms. And if I sum them together, then I have the same action that I ought to get automatically within the Clifford algebra. So in differential form language, I'm actually bringing together these two things that are often kind of awkward to define side by side uh, in a very natural way. And if I expand this out into um, 3D, if I just square the Dirac operator, I can see what that is very easily by just inserting the identity in between the two factors because it's associative algebra and then using my uh, factor expressions that I have up above. And then I'll just get these expressions, uh, which I can then complete the square or uh, just distribute. And you'll see I'll get exactly the Laplacian um, as you expect, or the wave operator, the Delambertian. The so square of the Dirac, Dirac operator is the Delambertian. And if I go back and now think about what I just said with this Dirac operator essentially being the sum of the co-differential and, and the exterior derivative, when I square that, the co-differential squared is zero, the exterior derivative squared is zero. So all I'm going to get are the cross terms. And indeed, uh, that cross term is precisely how you properly define the Laplacian on a differential manifold. So everything we expect to see from differential forms is here kind of built in already and behaves exactly the correct way. So if I'm used to thinking about kind of vector calculus as an undergrad, that's here. If I'm used to thinking about differential forms in a manifold, that's here as well. Uh, Clifford algebra is sufficiently flexible that I can kind of morph it into whatever way of looking at it that I, I find most helpful at that moment. Uh, and the last thing here is this, this vector derivative that I've kind of written up here. If I expand that out, that's actually embedded as kind of this, this uh, curl part of this four derivative. And that is exactly what we would expect it to be, which is uh, the three relative three vectors uh, with their corresponding spatial um, partial derivatives. Uh, so that's exactly how I define the three gradient in physics 102. It, starts, it, it is embedded here as you expect. And then again, if I take that three gradient and I multiply it by a three vector, then because we're in a Clifford algebra that again expands into a dot product between the three vectors and then a wedge product between the three vectors, and the wedge product, if I take the dual of that, uh, then I'll get the curl when I'm in three, three dimensions, the usual cross product. Um, and so you see that this, this contains all the usual divergence and curl in 3D that I'm, I'm used to, and I can access it at will very, very 
quickly. Okay, so there's your algebra 101 diversion. Uh, so now we can go back to what we were thinking about to begin with, which is to let's let's um, think about electromagnetism and acoustics now in this four dimensional framework and see what we can learn. So let's start with electromagnetism because uh, everyone's more or less familiar with that. Well, if I think about electromagnetism inside this framework, then the electromagnetic field is a Faraday, Faraday bivector, which I can just expand out in this basis of planes in my algebra. Uh, and if I just zip that all up in terms of my three vector notation, then I see I get two three vectors, the electric three vector and the magnetic three vector. And there's a factor of I between them, which means this actually reproduces the same complex three vector form that Riemann and Silberstein uh, came up with independently in the 1920s, I believe. So this complex three vector is a very natural way of writing this electromagnetic field. Uh, but now this factor of I here is not just a scalar imaginary. It actually has geometric meaning within this formalism. And similarly, I can think about a source vector, uh, which is a four vector, but now I can also add kind of the dual of a four vector, which would be a four pseudo vector, and think about both of those things. Since I kind of have a complex structure here, just in the bivector itself, I can reproduce that complex structure in terms of the source as well. Uh, and we get a, a sum of a ve vector and a pseudo vector, which when I expand out into 3D into a particular reference frame gamma naught, uh, just looks like the usual electric charge, electric current, and magnetic charge, magnetic current. So if I had such a thing, I can just write it here and there's no problem. And then if I just take the derivative of the by vector and set it equal to the source in this complex form, uh, this is everything you need from Maxwell theory in one equation. And to my knowledge, this is the only formalism where you can write down everything in one equation. Uh, and it's all there. And if I expand it out here, you see that um, just expanding in a particular reference frame, I'll get all the usual equations I expect to see uh, with all the correct matching up with the sources. And if I just match up grade by grade by grade, what must be equal to each other, I'll get exactly all four Maxwell's equations with both electric and magnetic sources included. Uh, and it all works exactly as you expect. I, I have a question. Yeah. So in this e e equation, where is the Bianchi B B identity? Where is the Bianchi identity? Yes. Yeah, so that, that happens um, automatically because if I take um, another curl of these pieces, then it's going to be zero automatically. So in fact, what's happening here, which is actually very neat, um, I'm, I'm making a little no, more- I mean, B and T identity is the first uh, derivative in terms of electric field and magnetic field. If you do another derivative, that means you have the second derivative on electric field and magnetic field. It's not B and T identity. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the Bianca identity will be the exterior derivative of F will be zero because uh, it has a, it's defined in terms of a potential as an exterior derivative. Yeah, so you need to expand the in terms of potential. Yeah, the identity. So it, it is there, it's, it's hidden there, but it, it is there. No, I mean, you, you, when, when you want to have the BIK identity, you need to rise the E and H in terms of, of, of potential, then that automatically is there. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it is here as well. Uh, it's, it's hidden here. Uh, but it is here as well. No, I, I think this equation is the equation for 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 so much equation for source, but not be and be a good entity. That thing is um, actually. Sorry, um, if um, if you turn off uh, magnetic sources, then then you get the Bianchi identity. No, no. You said you have both magnetic source and electric electric source, right? You have both of them. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what's very very subtle here is that you have both the Bianchi identities for the field and its dual are still valid in this formalism, even though I have both electric and magnetic sources. And that is not at all obvious <laughs> in this form on the left, which is why I'm mapping it to the form on the right, which is the differential forms version. In order to write it down in differential forms, I have to define the dual field here, G. The dual field is just the Hodge star, which in this algebra is just multiplying by I. And all that does is swap my fields around um, but then the two kind of um, halves of Maxwell's equations, 
for the electric and the magnetic sources, I can write in terms of a co-differential in the following way, that the co-differential of F is equal to the electric source, but then the co-differential of G is equal to the magnetic source. And so what this um, Clifford product is doing with our derivative is actually combines both of these co-differentials into a single operation with the dual. Uh, and so it's actually encoding both of these equations into what you see on the left there. Um, but if I also take just the exterior differential of F, I will get zero. And if I take the exterior differential of G, I will also get zero. And so both Bianchi identities are still valid here, even though I have these source equations using the co-differential. And I think this, this possibility is not as well known, maybe? Um, Justin, Justin, a dumb quick, quick question. Um, your system is self-dual, right? In, in terms of the two form. OK. Is it? I mean, that's a, that's a question I'm asking. It is. It seems to be, right? So if I, if I take the Hodge dual of um, a two form, the anti-symmetric two form, that's equal, you know, I, I, that the, the system of equation looks the same, um, the Maxwell equations. Close. Uh, that, that's exactly what I did right here. This dual right. field, that is the Hodge dual. Right. What the Hodge so, dual does is it doesn't quite leave it invariant. It actually swaps the roles of the electric and magnetic field. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So basically the statement of the Bianchi identity in general is the exterior derivative of the two form is zero. Right. Right. And also there's other, there's a, the Hodge dual of the exterior derivative of um, the dual two form is also zero. Mm -hmm. And so that, that applies in this case. Right. So the Bianchi identity is satisfied. Thank you. Correct. Correct. Even though we have both sources, which is yeah. again, uh, so that, nothing's violated here. It's just encoded in a very compact way, such that everything is kind of manifestly geometric in the correct way. <laughs> so that's not going to do what you don't expect. Um, OK, is this more or less clear now? I want to make sure that this is making sense. In, in, yeah, in, in the interest of time, maybe we should continue, and then we can have like more technical questions at the end. OK. OK, so if this is Maxwell's theory, now if I do the same thing with the acoustic theory, uh, then we'll see a very similar framework. I'm going to have a velocity field four vector now that's combining my pressure and my three velocity fields together. Um, and I need some factors here, just like I did in the um, <clears throat> electromagnetic case, just to get the units correct. Uh, but it is a four vector. It transforms correctly. Uh, and the main difference from electromagnetism is that this four velocity field is one grade lower than the bivector, the Faraday bivector. And it turns out that one difference in grade as our starting point causes all of these other differences that we saw at the very beginning. So it's just lowering the grade by one and otherwise it's basically the same procedure. Um, now, if I take the derivative of a four vector in this case, then again, this derivative expands into both uh, a divergence and a curl, which both lowers the grade and raises the grade, which means that uh, lowering the grade from a vector will give me a scalar part, and raising the grade from a vector will give me a bivector part. And so that means this equation actually admits a source on the right-hand side that is both a scalar part and a bivector part. And when you sum a scalar with a bivector, then you get a spinner. This is the usual notion of a spinner, it turns out. Um, and so this acoustic source actually admits a spinner source in 4D, where the scalar part of that spinner source is the pressure source. And in a particular reference frame, uh, the vector part, the, the boost vector part, is the velocity source. But then there's also this funny kind of rotational source that's admitted in the equation. Uh, and this is, this is very interesting, uh, which I won't have time to, to talk about much today, but I'll highlight it here, that when this is zero, if I just look at this equation on the left and I expand it out into three space correctly, you'll see that that H source corresponds exactly to this kind of longitudinality condition. When H is zero, then my acoustic field's longitudinal. And so then this uh, rotational source actually breaks longitudinality of my field uh, if I allow it there which means because these uh, components mix as I go to different reference frames, 
uh, if when I boost in my acoustic field, I'm going to get an effective rotation from the boost itself, a kin kinematic effect that will break the longitudinality of the acoustic field in that frame, um, which is a, a curious feature. That's really obvious in 4D and really wouldn't be obvious otherwise. Uh, but you'll see, we'll just set this to zero going forward. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that all of our acoustic equations are reproduced correctly, including this longitudinality condition uh, when, we, when we set h to zero. And we can also rewrite this in a differential forms way um, in a similar way to electromagnetism if we would like. So far, so good. Now, potentials. This is where we, we wanted to go. Now, in electromagnetism, the origin of the potentials actually comes from essentially the Poincaré lemma. And there's actually two versions of the Poincaré lemma that are going to matter. The first is that all, it, 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 all exact forms are closed is just a true statement, which in differential forms means taking two exterior derivatives always vanishes. In our formalism, the exterior derivative is exactly this curl operation in 4D. So if I take the curl of the curl in 4D, it vanishes. Uh, now the Poincaré lemma says that uh, if I have the curl of something vanishing, then as long as it's a suitable topological space, uh, then I can represent that thing as a curl of something else. And so if I have a bivector and its curl is zero, that means I must have a vector uh, whose curl is that bivector. And this is in fact how you get the electric potential usually, is you just say df is zero, therefore f is d of some vector, exactly as everyone's used to. And that gives you the electric potential. So that comes directly from the Poincaré lemma. But there's a dual form of the Poincaré lemma that I think is less well known which is that the co-derivative of the co-derivative also vanishes. And in our notation, that's just the um, divergence of the divergence vanishes. And uh, that means all co-exact forms are co-closed. And the dual Poincaré lemma is basically doing the exact same thing. So if I have something whose divergence vanishes, that means I can have some object when I take its divergence will give me my original thing. And if I write it in terms of the co-derivative uh, in forms, then it's basically this implication here. Uh, and then you can see how that just turns into the dual of a, uh, a similar type of vector. So you get kind of a pseudo vector potential uh, as opposed to a vector potential. And that works out the same way here in the Clifford formalism. And so we get two different types of potentials in electromagnetism, an electric potential and a magnetic pseudo vector potential. Um, and they couple the different types of sources. The electric potential couples to electric sources, and the magnetic pseudo vector potential couples to magnetic sources, which are usually zero, which is why this potential's left out most of the time. Now it turns out in acoustics, we can follow exactly the same logic and say that, uh, well, the usual approach is using kind of the standard Poincaré lemma. And that would say, uh, if I have a vector, a four vector, then I would get a scalar field as its potential field. And this is how we get a scalar potential. The scalar potential will couple to pressure sources in a similar way to how the electric potential couples to uh, electric sources. But we can also go the other way. And this appears to be much less developed. Um, it has appeared in some mostly computational methods papers, as far as I can tell, but otherwise is relatively less known as a possible representation of acoustic fields. The point is that I, I have a four vector, uh, its divergence is zero. Therefore, I can treat it as a divergence of something else. And that something else will be one grade higher, so it's a bivector. Uh, so that means there is a potential that is a bivector potential that will produce this uh, four vector or the pressure velocity. So that is part of the answer to our question. Uh, about how we can treat spin, because now we have an object, this bivector that has enough directionality in it that it can actually handle spin. Uh, so let's, let's look at a few more features here. So we're used to gauge freedoms in the electromagnetic case, and we're used to treating a radiation in the far field. This is a very quick reminder. Uh, we define our Faraday bivector as the curl of the potential, which leaves a gauge freedom of a gradient that you can add. Uh, but if you do a Lorentz Fitzgerald condition, which basically makes it um, 
a transverse in 4D, then Maxwell's equation is reduced to just a manifest wave equation of, of our vector potential. And then in a particular reference frame, if we're fully away from sources and some radiation far field, we can further constrain the frame to fully fix the gauge, uh, in which case we can impose this kind of Coulomb radiation gauge on the vector potential. And that's equivalent to making the three vector potential transverse and just eliminating the scalar part entirely. Um, that's a very convenient um, gauge to work in. But in the acoustic case, now we can follow basically the same logic that we have a, a four vector, that's the divergence of a bivector. This means that it has a gauge freedom, which is a curl. Um, and if we do a similar Lawrence Fitzgerald like condition, but kind of the other way around, the curl of the bivector is zero, then it'll manifestly produce a wave equation for the whole bivector, which couples to a bivector source. Um, and this is a subtle point here because on the left to notice that this electric vector coupled to an electric source, the magnetic source is sort of left out. Uh, same thing happened here. Our scalar source, our pressure source is left out in this process. Um, and then once we're in this kind of, um, kind of covariant gauge, then we can fully fix the gauge in a particular reference frame by doing something very similar. We demand longitudinality of this three vector part of, of the bivector in that frame. Uh, and we just set the pseudo vector part to zero, which is the equivalent of setting this scalar potential to zero. So this is the equivalent of the Coulomb gauge for the acoustic field. But then once we're in this, these Coulomb-like gauges, now we can actually interpret what these potentials mean uh, in, in a more physical way. So starting with the electromagnetic case, um, the electric and magnetic fields are now defined in this, in this gauge as just uh, the minus time derivative and the curl. Uh, and this three vector potential has the units of momentum per unit charge. So that means the electric field is literally the rate at which momentum is removed from the field, uh, which makes sense as far as uh, the Lorentz force goes. And the magnetic field is describing the circulating character of that momentum of the field described by this three vector. Um, and if we follow the same logic in the acoustic case, then we find that the pressure is equal to the gradient of this thing X and the velocity is the minus time derivative of this thing x, where I've just rescaled this a part of my bivector by some factor. Now this has units of position. And so this can be interpreted as a mean molecular displacement field, such that the velocity fields that I'm using to describe my waves are uh, connected. Uh, they oppose the velocity of the mean displacements of the molecules in very much the same way that the momentum is transferred from the field. Now I get kind of a velocity being transferred from the field directly. And similarly, the pressure is now the um, divergence of the same displacement field, which means it's describing the expanding and contracting character of that displacement field. There's a very kind of intuitive meaning to this potential. It's not some abstract calculation entity. It actually has a physical meaning. Uh, and I think that's important to see. And that's something that the acoustic case, because it's so concrete, allows us to see a little bit more easily. OK, but we came here to talk about spin. And now we're finally at the point where we can start addressing that problem. So now we have multiple potentials where we can plot them into the Lagrangian, do our Lagrangian stuff, derive our uh, spin vector, and see what we get. And in the electromagnetic case, we find that the spin actually depends on which potential representation we pick. If we pick the electric potential, then we get a spin vector that looks like, like this in that Coulomb light gauge. Uh, and it's asymmetric between the electric and magnetic fields. If I pick the magnetic pseudo vector potential, then I'm going to get a sort of a corresponding magnetic contribution to the spin, which is again asymmetric in the electric and magnetic fields. And if I follow the same logic in the acoustic case, if I pick the bivector potential in this Coulomb-like gauge, then I get this spin vector, which makes a lot of sense. It's kind of MV cross uh, the position. So it's related to <clears throat> what I would expect to see from intrinsic angular momentum. Um, but if I go with the scalar potential, then of course I get zero because it can't support spin. So now I have a very strong asymmetry <laughs> between my two potential representations. And the key point here is that none of these are correct. Um, 
all four of these are wrong. Uh, and when you actually go and put probe particles in a field and measure the torque on them, you do not get any of these four answers. Instead, you get these combinations down below, which if you look co closely are the uh, even average of those two options. I get both the electric and magnetic contributions of equal proportion uh, in the spin for the electromagnetic case. And in the acoustic case, the same thing happens. I get zero and this non-zero in equal proportion. So I get an extra factor of one half. And you can derive this factor of one half from a microscopic treatment and see that it does in fact need to be there to account for the torques on these small probe particles. So this throws another wrench in our field theory story because now we have several valid field theory perspectives, none of which give us the right answer. <laughs> we know what the right answer is, and it's tantalizingly close to all the answers that we derived, uh, but it's not equal to any of them, which means there's still something wrong. Uh, so how do we fix this problem? How do we derive this correctly? Um, so in the electromagnetic case, we've worked this out fairly recently, which is sort of how I got into this topic in the first place. And the, the story very quickly is that in vacuum, there is a natural phase freedom of this electromagnetic bivector, which allows a complete swapping uh, between the electric and magnetic fields. There, and you can call this the dual symmetry of the electromagnetic fields in vacuum. But because of this phase freedom, you can just sort of rotate them to be whatever you want uh, and just redefine them as new fields. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, and you can think of this as equivalent to the global phase freedom of some quantum state, for example. Now, in the presence of sources, it turns out that almost the same thing is true. As long as I rotate both my bivector and my source with the same phase, then the whole thing is invariant. Uh, and so this is also a symmetry even with sources. But then you see that what the symmetry does on the source is it rotates electric sources into magnetic sources. And so I can actually just swap electric and magnetic sources to be whatever I want and just call that my system and I'll get exactly the same dynamics. And this means, of course, I can always choose a case where the magnetic sources are zero and make everything electric. Uh, but in principle, I can just change my description uh, as, as much as I want. So this phase symmetry here actually has pretty deep implications for how I should write a, um, uh, my potentials. So because F itself has a phase freedom, then I should choose potentials that also have this phase freedom. And so if I just postulate that there should be some complex vector potential that includes both an electric and a magnetic part in some equal proportion like this, uh, and I assume these Lorentz Fitzgerald conditions, then Maxwell's equation just becomes a manifest wave equation for that whole complex potential. Uh, and then when I look at what is the Faraday bivector, it's going to have equal proportions of both the electric and the magnetic potentials. And in this form, uh, and I don't quite have time to talk about this at length, but this is a form of what's called the Hodge decomposition, uh, where I can take of any form and I can decompose it into a curl and a divergence. Um, and I'm doing that here. And in order to do that, I actually need both potentials in general. Now, uh, when you look at what are the relative E and H fields in terms of these potentials, then you see that recovers this kind of nice symmetric form, which probably most people haven't seen, but it looks much more balanced in some sense. But then once we have this um, complex potential, now we can write down a different Lagrangian. And this different Lagrangian will have both the complex vector potential and its conjugate, which is basically its, its complex conjugate. Um, and just like complex scalar fields, we'll treat both this complex vector field Z and its conjugate as independent potential fields. And now I have a Lagrangian where I can vary it with respect to both Z and Z tilde, get two different equations of motion, which you see here. One of them is correctly Maxwell's equation. And the other one is an equation for this conjugate, which in order to be satisfied actually forces uh, these two contributions of the electric and magnetic parts to be exactly equal to each other. And so in vacuum, it locks them to have exactly equal contributions. Uh, and even more interestingly, and again, I don't quite have time to, to talk about it in detail, but if you put a source on this, 
And it turns out that the nature of the source and the boundary conditions of the source create non-trivial equations of motion for the conjugate that then force a different asymmetry of the contributions of how the electric and magnetic potentials contribute to the measured field. And so if I have only one type of source, it'll force me into one type of potential and vice versa. But in vacuum, uh, there is no such constraint and it forces me to have equal contributions in vacuum. Now, uh, if I do all of Noether's theorem stuff with this new Lagrangian that has this complex vector potential in it, uh, then what I find is that the global phase symmetry that I identified produces a new conserved quantity as a Noether charge, which is the helicity pseudocurrent of the electromagnetic field. And the spin pseudo vector is part of that, and it gives us correctly the symmetric form uh, of the spin. So this actually gives us what we measure correctly. Um, and as a bonus, we also get this correct helicity density, which again, we can measure. But these definitions only work in vacuum if I start with this kind of dual symmetric potential formalism. So I need both the electric and magnetic potentials in order to preserve this symmetry in the vacuum, uh, which I think is, again, not widely appreciated. Um, but this tells us now a big clue how to proceed in the acoustic case. We have two different potentials. So let's combine them. Let's just add them together with equal contributions. I'm going to get kind of a scalar part of the potential and a bivector part of the potential. And if I add a scalar to a bivector, that gives me a spinner. And so I now have a spinner potential for my four vector field. And now if I, uh, again, assume this kind of Lorentz Fitzgerald-like condition on the bivector, then taking the derivative of my four vector will give me a manifestly wave equation for my spinner potential as it couples to the spinner source. Um, and so all this is now consistent. And if I look at how my four vector decomposes, again, I'm going to have equal contributions of my scalar and bivector potentials, which means my pressure and my velocity fields now have kind of this symmetric decomposition in terms of the scalar and this displacement field that you see here, and also this kind of rotational field I didn't talk about too much. Now, I can follow the same type of logic as the dual symmetric electromagnetic case, and now write down a complex spinner Lagrangian of this form. Um, and again, I'm going to have the spinner and its conjugate as independent fields, and so I'll get two different equations of motion. One of them gives me correctly the acoustic equation of motion, and the other one gives me a constraint equation that forces the different potentials to have equal contribution. And again, if I put in sources here, then I actually get a source locking mechanism that uh, steers which potential contributes to my measured field. Um, and then if I do my Lagrangian um, techniques to pull out what the spin vector must be, I now get correctly this factor of one half that averages between the two results I had before. Uh, and this now matches what we'll, we can measure if we just do an average over a monochromatic field uh, and cycle average it. This is what they expect to see. This is what you measure in the lab uh, and everything works out. So with that, apologies for going a few minutes over time. Um, but the, the key takeaway message here is that first of all, acoustic fields have spin, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we can now derive it correctly with the Grangians, which wasn't at all trivial, it turns out. Um, second point I hope I got across is that this Clifford algebra, if you actually use it seriously, is very convenient and sort of subsumes a whole lot of other tools in the process. You can sort of dance between different formalisms easily. Um, the dual symmetric theory of electromagnetism uh, is much easier to describe in this formalism because it's all talking about geometrically invariant forms. And it's also an interesting point that um, when you make it dual symmetric, we get an additional conserved quantity from the Noether's theorem, which is exactly the helicity of the field, which we know should be conserved. So that gives us kind of a hint that that's probably the right way to go. Um, but then as a, as a final note, we can do follow the same type of logic, get a spinner potential for acoustics, and then we correct, correctly get the spin density that you measure in the lab. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Justin, for that wonderful talk. Um, I know that we have gone over time. So for those of us that need to go, um, feel free. Um, otherwise, 
um, we'll continue on. Just if anyone has any um, questions for Justin, um, I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of good ones. Yeah, so happy, please shoot away. Any questions? I, I have a few questions actually. Sure. Can you go 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 back to the slide with the experiment setup? Yeah, this one. No, the, the next. This one? Yeah, this one. So basically, can you explain to me what, what exactly they, they measure? What exactly do they measure? Yeah. Ah, so uh, if you look here on the right, um, these are the speakers that they set up, kind of perpendicular to each other. And they just put basically a little fan in the middle. And so if there is a, uh, a um, spin, then it'll produce a direct torque on this fan. And if there's no spin, then that fan will not get any torque. It won't get any orbital angular momentum because it's sort of fixed point. So you'll only get torque on this fan if there's intrinsic spin in the acoustic field. What they found is that uh, if they just take two waves, uh, set them to be equal amplitude, and then make their phases uh, go out of phase, then they can create orbiting molecules in the sound field. And depending on how they choose the phases, they can choose which direction it orbits, either right or left. And so what you see here are cases where they choose um, phase locked. So there's no difference in phase, which means linear polarization, which means no spin. Uh, and then they can change the phases either direction. And then you'll see a measured torque on this fan going either direction, depending on those phases. And everything matches up correctly with uh, what you'd expect from the intrinsic spin of the field, like so. Uh, and the, the, one, the, the form they actually use in the paper is this um, cycle average form, which is why I listed here. The reason the cycle averaged form is, is kind of preferred in some ways by many authors is because it's manifestly gauge invariant. It's only depending on your, your velocity fields. There's no potential in it, like this X is part of the potential formally on the left. Uh, but it turns out that this potential in a particular reference frame is well-defined uh, and there's no freedom there and it is physically meaningful. So we shouldn't be scared of that potential but when we work with a monochromatic field, we can always write it in a way where we don't have to look at the potential either. <laughs> and of course, we know it should work this way because otherwise we wouldn't get a gauge invariant form <laughs> if there wasn't something meaningful about this. Um, I actually have a quick question before um, um, Dung continues. So just to get up in terms of maybe building some physical intuition here. So I have a density. Um, I have an environment like a fluid environment. Then I have some over density um, in the velocity, in, in the source of, of some uh, of molecules, let's say, some continuous medium. I have some density. Um, and this density has a non vanishing, it, it has rotation, right? Um, above the average fluid um, background, mm -hmm. right? So it has some, it's rotating. And according to this system, um, this will source um, transverse waves, so transverse sound waves, um, this rotating and over density. That's the first thing I conclude from this physically moving at the speed of sound. And my question is, the, if I think about this as some kind of radiative um, field moving, propagating away, what is the configuration? Is it something that's looking like a, it's like, you know, um, spherical harmonics of like, you know, of, um, odd parity or something that's propagating out at the speed of sound? What's the, what's the configuration of the radiation field? In other yeah, words? This, this is a great question. And, and it's very tricky because the spin field doesn't necessarily propagate. Because very often these spin fields arise from kind of- Yeah, that was the essence of my question, actually. Yeah, yeah. So they stay kind of localized because they're interfering, uh, their interferences between different directional propagations in some sense. So they'll say like a localized circulation. And then when the waves pass by, then they're no longer interfering. So the spin no longer is there. That's, um, we should talk about that. There's a, there's a gravitational counterpart to what you just said there. Perfect. Yeah, there's a so-called spin tensor in general relativity and, and Einstein core transformers and that's that has yeah I, I had suspicions that there were big connections here just because the nature of sound waves is kind of a lot like gravitational waves <laughs> yeah much setting. yeah yeah totally that basically is will be the equivalent of torsion right. in our general relativity, a source of torsion 
which right. is it's, it's the, the dual of the di um, of the divergence of the um, the um, yeah the tetrad. But anyway, we could talk more about that. that's very interesting connection there. Anyway, uh, so and, and and any more questions, please. And maybe sure. I could squeeze in a question before Zhang uh, uh, continues. So um, in this experiment, we have a fluid, and fluid is not does not just have compressional degrees of freedom, but has rotational degrees of freedom. So can we just take a more traditional approach? And uh, if we were to think about, say, a compressible Navier-Stokes equation, that would support both um, sound waves and vorticity. Um, so perhaps uh, this experiment can be interpreted just in terms of some vorticity in the fluid uh, that would be described by this compressible Navier Stokes equation. Yeah, it's the same, it's, it's my same question. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm sure that if you extend this formalism beyond the linear regime, because remember that we started with linear waves here, which is an approximation. But of course, if we don't make that approximation, then a whole lot more stuff is possible. You're completely right. Um, but there is a slight difference because intrinsic spin is a pointwise work. Whereas a vorticity thing, if you actually have a fluid moving in a circle, that is a orbital angular momentum. Uh, and the two are not necessarily the same. Uh, <laughs> they're of course related at the microscopic level because this uh, intrinsic spin is actually kind of microscopic orbits. But at the level of the field theory description, you're sort of um, smoothing over those uh, length scales of those little orbital motion. And so you're treating that entire motion on average as a single point that has intrinsic torque. Um, and so th there is a difference and that difference actually manifests in how it interfaces with probes. Now this fan they have here is probably too big to actually distinguish these two things because any vortex around the fan is gonna cause it to, to torque as well. Uh, but if you have a very, very small point probe with like little propeller on it or something like that, and you drop it into such a field, then you can actually distinguish the orbital angular momentum from the spin angular momentum by how the particle behaves. Because if the particle just starts rotating in place, uh, that means it's getting a pointwise torque. And that pointwise torque must come from the spin angular momentum of the field. But if the particle actually starts orbiting in a circle, then that means it's coming from an orbital angular momentum of the field, which would be kind of its, its vorticity. So these two things aren't necessarily interchangeable. Um, and at the level of the field theory description linearly here, we're really talking about pointwise spin, um, which of course is this very small spatial region physically. And it's pointwise with respect to this minimum length scale um, defined by the, the molecules and the medium, right? It's like an average point of the orbital or the, the mean free molecular path or something like that. Um, and to follow up on, on uh, who Brad, I think brought up um, the Navier-Stokes equation. If you look at the divergence of the stress tensor that you get um, from um, the Lagrangian, the acoustic Lagrangian, then, and it's, it's in space time, so it's a sort of 4D stress tensor. Then you get a Cauchy momentum equation that, that um, essentially boils down to a Navier Stokes equation that, that gives a picture of a way to move between the two. Right. So, what Luke's alluding to here is that uh, we're, we're starting to extend this beyond the linear regime and look at elastic waves and other more exotic cases. This is sort of the simplest case. I guess this would be what the equivalent of the gravitational wave linearized metric case <laughs> to uh, use your analogy earlier. Did I answer or did Luke help answer a uh, question on vorticity and Navier Stokes? Uh, I'm going to think about it. <laughs> yeah, the, the complication is that many more things are possible when you bring in the full fluid dynamics. Uh, and so at least within this restricted framework we've set up, um, this is strictly in the linear regime of that. Well, and now it, I have my last question. Uh, since in the experiment setup sim, so you air as uh, medium. So basically in this case, you cannot have the incompressible 
medium. So that's why I wonder how can you train your equation with that uh, problem? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. Because uh, what this would mean, is you see that it, with the way this tangent algebra is set up, um, at every point X in the medium, we have a different Minkowski tangent algebra. In principle, we could have a different speed of sound at every point in the medium. And in principle, we could have those speeds of sound actually vary dynamically. Uh, so the assumption that is a constant everywhere uh, is a very useful assumption. It turns out it's, it's pretty accurate for at least small sound waves. But you're right that if you had a very large sound wave, it would definitely not <laughs> keep the speed of sound constant because the air is a compressible medium. Uh, so you're going to get deviations away from the simple theory. But I think there are corrections you can make that would make the uh, speed of sound a dynamical field as well. And then you could still use this kind of Minkowski-like framework just with now a varying speed of sound. And that has interesting, I think, connections to some cosmological things where people are talking about varying speed of light over large sectors of space. Uh, this is the same kind of idea. So can, can they do the experiment in, in water? In this case, I think that your, your condition should be satisfied. I'm not sure I got your question. So I, I mean, if you want to have the in, 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 in compressible fluid, you can do experiment in, in water, then, then it could be good enough for your condition of the incompressible medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think as, as long as it's sufficiently close to incompressible, then this formalism will give you a good approximation of what's happening. And since the linear regime is already an approximation, that's probably reasonable. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. Sure. Um, so you've you've written down these Lagrangians, like let's say for the E and M case uh, for familiarity, where you have kind of this global symmetry explicitly in the Lagrangian. Um, yes. Let me pull it up so I have a reference. Yeah. Thanks. And so I, may, I think I may, may have just missed. Uh, you were defining a quantity that is the the conserved charge associated with this this global symmetry, right? Ah, so you're talking about the dual symmetry. So yeah, this is manifestly phase. Yes, symmetry. that's right. Yeah, so you have kind of a s duality as an explicit global symmetry in this Lagrangian, right? Correct. And so. Um... Yeah, so it's this this symmetry for the point. But the phase symmetry is manifestly invariant in that in that Lagrangian. Right. Um, so that means you can apply the whole Messer framework to get the, the conserved method charge. And so I guess uh, I'm not quite seeing if 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 I start now adding matter. Um, if I just do kind of standard minimal coupling for some matter, then obviously the, the, the this S duality doesn't behave very nicely on the potentials directly. So it, I'm kind of wondering what happens to the symmetry if I start adding in matter. Uh, is there a way to even if I add in some magnetic matter into the Lagrangian? I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're asking a very good question because you see here I've had to kind of generalize everything to make it complex in order to handle this symmetry. Yeah. And same thing will happen with minimal coupling, because uh, just if I treat minimal coupling meaning um, kind of this linear term in the Lagrangian first, this kind of A dot J essentially. Yes. Uh, then what I'm going to have to generalize that to is kind of the Z, now this complex Z, dotted in a complex way with a complex J, which I have here. And so as long as the complexity is handled correctly, so it's a sort of like Z star dot J. Uh, then the phase will still be manifestly preserved. 
But in order to handle all that, I've had to sort of complexify everything. I've had to complexify the potentials, I've had to complexify the source uh, and so forth. And when you complexify the source, then of course, um, then you get uh, the magnetic sources as well. Uh, I guess that's further back. So you get all the, yeah, here, um, sorry. You get all the consequences of that. So if I'm willing to complexify the source, that means I'm willing to rotate between electric and magnetic descriptions of my source. Yes. Uh, and as long as I'm okay with that kind of relabeling and thinking, oh, this could be interpreted as a magnetic source, uh, then there's no problem. And I can write down that manifest um, linear term in the Lagrangian. Uh, but that so is the, the symmetry has a simple action on the potentials themselves. I guess that would be surprising to me. Um, yes, I, 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 I think that maybe the extra symmetry in is it can be uh, thing of as you have like um, uh, gauge and formation of like uh, 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 your uh, uh, usual gauge field. Perhaps uh, a mu go to the, a mu plus d mu of alpha. And now I think that you can have an extra symmetry like 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 uh, c mu go to c mu uh, go to c mu plus d mu of alpha m. You can have like two gauge transformation, the gauge transformation for the electromagnetic sure. sector, yes. and you can have the magnetic sector. Here you see that you have both uh, both a vector and C vector. Mm -hmm. And, that, and it, you can see the, the, the letter equation you have E written in terms of both uh, A few and C few, actually. Right, so let me pull back to here. Yeah, okay. in this case. And you see that both E and A would be invariant under the transformation of like alpha and alpha M. So you have two cap U1. Yep, and I can say something even more general, which might make you feel better. Uh, if you look at the form of this phase symmetry, just in this equation here, notice this is an automorphism uh, with a group element. And so since I have an associative algebra here, any automorphism will be able to just transform all elements in the algebra in some standard way. So I can just treat this as an automorphism of the entire algebra if I want. Yeah. And then it's much more clear how this just applies. Uh, and that's part of the benefit of writing it in this kind of double-sided spinorial form, uh, spinner transformation form, because it makes the automorphism character on the associative algebra uh, much more apparent. Interesting. Yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, because I'm just normally used to there's some some Because normally I expect just a, the, the, these these dualities work, you know, act more not or in much more complicated way on the potentials directly, you know, which which I think is just, uh, I mean, I think this is pretty slick. So, yeah, I, I think that's part of my point with this Clifford algebra approach is that if you drill down and look at sort of what it looks like in three D, like for example here, when I look at the definition of E and H in three D, it looks kind of ugly in a lot of ways. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> there. And so if I were trying to worry about how things transform at that level, it, it's a lot of bookkeeping in some sense. Yeah. But by zooming out to this kind of 4D language, um, it really makes a lot of structure much more apparent and it cleans up a lot of the derivations, but in a way where I can always kind of drill down into 3D whenever I want to. At least I've, I've personally found it very productive in some sense of reasoning about these systems because you can manipulate them much more quickly. Yeah, this is really interesting. In fact, this is a, maybe a good example here. Like when I have um, this, this phase transformation of a derivative of f, and I actually map out what that's doing in 3D, then you see you get this kind of nice planar rotation of E and B mm -hmm. built into that. But it's much easier to think about exponentials than it is about this yes. planar. 
Um, maybe a, a tangential question, but I mean, is, a, do you expect any surprises if you were to start trying to quantize any of these Lagrangians or? Uh, uh, well, that, that is part of the goal here is to figure out what quantization actually means in some sense. Because uh, something that's been kind of fun working with these purely classical fields in 4D, uh, um, I guess I'd have to go back pretty far. Maybe I'll do it. Uh, is that a lot of these things that we normally think of as sort of intrinsically quantum somehow are there? Uh, in classical fields, if I just write them in the, this geometric language, like these uh, Pauli vectors and Dirac matrices, et cetera. A lot of these exponentials of Pauli's to represent rotations, that's just already in the algebra, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the things that you normally associate with quantum are actually not really quantum. They're just geometrical in 4D. Um, they just happen to have been discovered around the same time as quantum mechanics. And so they kind of got associated with quantum mechanics. Yeah, but I think that you, at the end, you have the, the Lagrangian, right? Yeah. It, it can, it, we we know how to quantize for sure. Exactly. So we have a Lagrangian for classical field, and we could always just throw that into a path integral or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and everything that we're doing is this classical field, so it should work exactly the same way. We're just sort of looking at different features than may have been apparent um, with other methods of looking at those classical fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess the, but, um, you know, like one of the equations of motions, right, was, was tying together the two potentials, let's say, in the absence of sources. Um, so that, you know, at least from kind of a naive degree of freedom counting, it would seem like, okay, you know, I haven't, I don't suddenly have a photon with four. Uh, polarizations or something, right? Or, um... I think that in this case you have have two two kind of gauge field, right? You have the uh, electric gauge field and magnetic gauge field, right? Then but on shell, they're kind of related to one another, right? Uh, through the through the sources. Yeah, right. on shell is related, but when you when you quantize, you need to have like more degree of freedom because of that. Because you, you have the, uh, the, the, the equation of electric field in terms of both gauge field, and, and you have the Lagrangian, the classical Lagrangian, then I think for sure that you know how to quantize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, notably, what you quantize typically is the gauge field. Yeah. And you usually just expand it into some like Fourier basis, for example, and then you actually quantize the helicities um, separately. Uh, and uh, actually, let me back up there. This is an important point. There, there's both polarization and, and helicity um, of these fields. And if you look at, say, a Dirac electron, uh, it works almost the same way as here because it's basically the same algebra. You get the same Dirac matrices, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but when you do the quantization of the Dirac electron, there's a step where you say all the helicities of this type we're calling an electron. We'll have a raising operator for that. But then you also say all the opposite helicities, I'll have a different raising operator and call those anti-electrons. Mm -hmm. I actually quantize the two different helicities of the, the electron differently. Uh, but we don't do that with the photon, which is an interesting thing, that we use the same kind of A and A dagger for both helicities for the photon. Whereas in principle, you could separate the two helicities and have anti-photons explicitly quantized. It's a curious point, and I'm not sure how deep it is, but um, since the photon is essentially it's, its own antiparticle, that's what this means, is that the two helicities act like anti-modes in some sense. Uh, but when we quantize the electromagnetic field, we actually don't use that fact, oddly. I wonder if that's because um, you don't have interactions between, right? You don't have interactions that can distinguish between photons and it, you don't have helicity that as a charge for an interaction the way that you have electric charge as a um, charge for electric and electromagnetic interaction um, that would allow you to distinguish between uh, electrons and positrons. Well, uh, they have different angular momentum, so they have different selection rules and atomic transitions. So, right. so it may, may be important for other reasons. Yes. Yeah, it's unclear to me how 
how important it is. It's just curious to me that there's a difference in this style of quantization. 